Okay, so Dean, welcome to The Truth About Business and thank you for um, sharing some of your precious time at the moment. I know that everybody is just mad, mad busy dealing with all of the problems that this uh, coronavirus has thrown up for us. So I appreciate you joining us on the show today. No problem. Thanks for having me, mate. Looking forward to this one. Yes, no, this is one that I've really been looking forward to. So the way I like to start these interviews, because it helps us to lead off in all kinds of tangents, is it might be going away back now, but can you tell us about how you got your first job and, and how your, your career started? Well, mate, so I guess are we talking proper jobs? Because I did the milk round, the paper round. Um, I guess the first job I was excited about getting was working at Fine Fair in Simfin as a trolley collector. But that then went to Gateway and it's now Asda. And so that, that was when I felt I had real responsibility because I had a, a, a work overall in the non-food department. And we figured out that if you had like a blazer and not an overall, people gave you more respect. So whenever somebody left, we said, can I have your blazer? So that, that was the, the first one. Um, I did go to college um, to train to be a nanny. And then when I, when I didn't stick that one out, I got a job at the wholesale news agents, Bustles, which interestingly is now Bustler's Market. So every time I go back to Bustler's Market, it's where I used to work, which is very strange. And I, I used to work on the front counter there, taking orders off all the news agents in the UK and amending their radio times and TV times orders in the days before the internet, mate. So you mentioned there that that was, there was your first official jobs, but you were on the, the milk round and the paper round. So you were working from quite young then. Was that something that you were pushed into or were you just eager to get out there and start earning some money? No, I, ne I needed some cash. You know, I got my 50p pocket money off mum and dad and I'd go to Allington Market or Ford's the family store and decide what to spend my 50p on but I wanted a bit more um, so it was £1.25 for a paper round and if you did a Sunday round it was I think that was one fifty. paid more than a whole week weirdly uh, and, then, and then the milk round so I'd, I'd do the milk and I'd do the paper and it, it just put you know an extra five to ten quid a week in my pocket which I could go and buy bike parts and BMX parts because I used to go and race down Elveston track. Okay and that all still plays a big part in what you do now so you had that passion for sport and biking and cycling that's been there since a very early age. Yeah I, I, I kind of picked it up when I was at junior school Wyndham Street off Harvey Road and we had a sports day and I actually did all right and it was one of those things because weirdly I was a bit of a quiet kid at school and didn't mix very well um, and sport was like, yeah, I can do this. And we had a regional sports thing and I won an event there. So, um, I'm excited now. I've got something to kind of get my teeth into. So I was the kid who went Derby and County Athletic Club in my stretch jeans, running around the track, trying to keep up with all the pro athletes. <laughs> and from there, that got me to endurance sports and, and triathlon and running and, and everything that goes with it. So you're obviously a, a business owner now, which we'll get into a, a bit later on. But that earlier drive to go out there and earn money, was that to fuel the passion and the hobby that you had back then? Or do you, looking back, do you always think that you had that sort of entrepreneurial drive and spirit in you? Well, I, I've done the odd talk in the past when I, I've been fortunate to be asked and probably never asked back again. But <laughs> I always look back to the playground and it's not so relevant these days. But if you had marbles and you had glass eye marbles, which was a standard marble with colour in it, you could go and trade colours or one for one. If you got a milky, which was a white marble, you could trade that for probably four glass sides. And then if you got a ball bearing or you knew someone whose dad worked at British Rail or Rolls Royce who could get you a few ball bearings, or <laughs> steely bombies, as the old ones amongst us will know, you could trade them for 20 glass sides. So I believe that we're all born traders and whether it be football cards and swapping a Knott's Forest badge for anything anyone would give you, um, or uh, you know, a, a Peter Shilton for three Charlie Georges, whatever it was, we, we were traders in the playground. And I, and I think we all loved to trade and haggle and put a currency to our stock. And we never knew what we were doing. And I, and I think it's built into all of us. And it just depends how far you take it. You know, there was always one kid in the playground who had the biggest stack of Superman cards you've ever seen in your life. And one day he gave me all of his Superman cards. I said, well, why are you doing that? He said, Oh, it was just about getting the biggest pile and it, it's the same isn't it you know some people are in it just to shout and holler how they've got the biggest pile where others are actually in it to really collect and build something and, and so I, I believe it goes back to the playground but for me my passion being sport when I was 19 I, I took a bank loan out my mum and dad secured it and I set up the Derby Runner in Spondon with my business partner Pete so we were both owners in the business 
we launched that. After two and a half years, it really wasn't working for me, but it worked for Pete. So I left the business and I went to work on the other side of the industry. And the Derby Run is still there today and going strong. But that to me was heaven. I was into running, I'd compete at it, I trained in it. And here I am selling shoes. And I love shoes, running shoes. I could talk about them and play with them all day. And, and my future jobs were all shoe based. So if you can work in an, in, in an industry you enjoy, is it going to work? That's the question. Is it going to work? So you were 19 at the time when you borrowed this money to set up the Derby Runner. How did that chain of events spark off? Because, I mean, in anybody's book, that's young for somebody to go and, and get some money to start their own business. Yeah, that was, um, that was my coach, Pete, down at the running club, talking about, you know, running shoes. And I said, I'd like to open a shop. And he said, oh, so would I. And he, he, he wanted the security staying in his job. So that was me taking the pump with a business plan and going to the NatWest Bank which I think is now the standing order, and it was at the time, and going in the manager's office at the back and showing my plan and him giving the nod or not, my mum and dad securing it. Um, and it, it was just, it just felt, well, why wouldn't you do it? And I remember when I was painting the shop and putting some of the fittings in, my mates would come and see me, and, and I, I had a moment where I stood there and went, oh, this is really, really cool. I'm actually going to be building something. Now, I had my weaknesses, and some of that was, was, was the finance side of it because I didn't really care for the numbers I, it didn't interest me it was the stock side of it that interested me but it was like yeah I'm part of something and we're going to build this and grow this and, and why wouldn't you do it so people go oh you, you're taking a big leap and I'm just like I'm 19 I'm taking a leap into nothing I live with my mum and dad's I pay you know some of, some of my YTS money 15 quid goes to my mum and I'm left with 12 pound every week so you know what I, I'm not taking a big leap I'm I'm yeah, not going to be earning lots of money, but what the hell, let's do it. And what was the support like from family and friends around you? You've said that obviously some were telling you you were making a big leap, but in general, particularly with your mum and dad who you were living with at the time, did they see it as a good opportunity? Did they see you as, you know, a successful entrepreneur, somebody who could make something of it? <laughs> you know, probably at the time they thought, well, he can't make it as a male nanny. Um, and he's working at, a, he's, he's a glorified paper boy working at Bustles. So what are, we, what are we gonna do with him? I think for them it was exciting that I could move into something I enjoyed and they could see my passion. Um, I, I get quite intense with things and at times too intense with stuff. And I was so intense on shoes and, and what goes into them and going all the, all the shoe shops and looking at them. They could see it was a complete passion of mine. So I'm, I'm very lucky that they were able to support me and back me on a loan. It was a loan from the bank, not from them personally. We, we're not a well-off family at all and um, yeah I, I, I think for them it was comfort that Dean's on a pathway and let's see where it takes him. And where did it take you next then? You said that you'd been there for a couple of years and you decided to, to part ways with the Derby Runner even though it's still there today. What happened yeah, next? Um, if, I, if I knew more about partnership, if I knew then what I know now about partnership agreements I'd probably still be there but it didn't, it turns out I was paying myself to work there. A bit weird but when you're 21 and you're sat in front of the accountant and he gives you the bad news uh, we decided to leave um, and, and I had uh, you know a girlfriend then who was to be my wife and who I met when we were doing the nursery nursing um, and I got offered a job by a, a sports shoe company called Brooks and I knew the guy who run it uh, and he asked me to go into the industry and teach people how to sell running shoes the reason was they just won a big contract with um, a chain of shops that were called Pro Performance, that were an offshoot of British Shoe Corporation and Olympus. And it was a serious sports side. And it was almost JD before it was JD. Okay. And I, I had to go around every single one of those in the country, teaching the staff about Brooks running shoes, how to sell them, the performance benefits, the technologies inside. So I, I, I guess I was a salesman with, a, with a, a white Ford Sierra estate that had Hydroflow written down the side that was the technology of Brooks running shoes. Reality was I looked like a plumber that was clearing out drains and not, not what I thought I was. So people go, oh, what do you do? What's hydroflow? Are you, are you in water or, or sanitary? No, 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 no. It's running shoes. It was quite funny. First week I had that car, I reversed into a tree at the city hospital as well. <laughs> Good start. So just taking it back a notch as well, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that you were, I don't know if had aspirations is the right way of putting it, but you were on track to becoming a nanny. Yeah. Um, Where did that come from? 
So my sister, Faith, um, she has Down syndrome and I'd go to the nursery school in the summer holidays where they do like a summer camp and I, I just go there and I'd work with Faith and a lot of the other kids and play games and set up little races and it's just something that's quite natural and I think that's of course you know I've been blessed with a, a, a lovely little sister and, and two younger brothers that we just hung out together a, a lot of the time we were raised Jehovah's Witnesses um, so we did tend to do a lot of things together and it wasn't like going off and hanging out with your mates down the park kind of kind of lifestyle and I, I just enjoyed it so it made it made sense to move into a career where there might be a relatively quick pathway up the higher levels because I could be the only male and I got accepted onto the nursery nursing course at Mackworth College and there was one other guy on there, a guy called Trog. And I think it was after three months, Trog left. And then I was the last man standing. But it, 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 was, it was funny, Benjamin. Um, they'd, have, uh, they, they'd be discussing the reproductive organs. And there's 48 girls and me. And if I was skilled at being male, that would have played into my advantage. But I was a bit young and naive. And they, it was male reproductive sex organs, and they said, Dean, could you go up and please draw a penis? <laughs> so I, I drew quite a droopy penis. <laughs> and she said, Dean, I hope yours doesn't look like that. I was going to say that's dangerous, isn't it? Because uh, if you are asked to do that in front of a group of 48 women, then you, are, you obviously want to make it a good one because <laughs> it's going to well, be a reflection well, of you. <laughs> I mean, when I think of, of the world we live in today, I, there's probably a several hundred thousand pound lawsuit on that. <laughs> yeah, if I'd have known, I'd have drawn the, drawn the biggest boner you've ever seen. <laughs> so that first entrepreneurial experience of starting up the Derby Runner, it was obviously a success, which is, you know, in itself rare for somebody to, to start a business on their own, especially being that young and have it be a success. But do you look upon those early years with fond memories? Was that a time that you have good memories of? Oh, yeah, completely. Um, we, we opened at 12 o'clock and finished at 8 so it allowed me to train in the mornings and I was competing um, at, you know, at a relatively high level of triathlon and duathlon. Duathlon has no swimming in, which suits me better because it's not my forte. And I got to number three for a junior athlete in, in the country, wow. um, for duathlon, which suited me really well. I was you know, pleased to reach those heights and be selling shoes. And going home at eight was fine because my mates would come and pick me up in the little in the back of what we called the sooty van, and we'd go and tour the pubs of Derby and have a few beers. So it was good. Um, I, I look back at it now a little bit disappointed. I wish I was a little bit wiser in that business. Um, still disappoints me. I'm not on the homepage of their website that as, as an original founder, and that will probably bug me until it is put right. Maybe they'll listen to this and put it right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I absolutely loved it, and we had. We had a good summer and I'd be outside, you know, with my top off, trying to get a bit of tan going, uh, waiting for the shop to open with my magazines. And um, yeah, it, it was bliss, mate. It was absolute bliss. So f after the Derby Runner, you had a, a few positions where you were employed. That first taste of being a business owner and an entrepreneur, was that something that you knew you would eventually come back to? Or what were your thoughts going back into the employed environment? Well, it's weird when when I worked for Brooks after six months um, the distributor was going down the pan and I could smell that and I jumped ship and went for work for another shoe and golf brand called Etonic and that was led by a guy called Robbie Brightwell who was an Olympic medalist and very inspirational and worked for Adidas and he just made you feel like you had the best job in the world and I worked with a, um, another guy there called Nick Curry who works for me now as my sales manager weirdly um, and we just felt, we'd feel like we had the best jobs in the world. I was driving around in a Ford Escort 1.6L. I did 75,000 miles a year. And I was happy as a pig in muck. It was fantastic. And then they, they got um, taken over by um, Spalding, basketball um, and golf and licensed brand. So I found myself traveling up and down the country. I got, I got half of England, London and Scotland. And... I was selling golf balls and basketballs to retail outlets, which was really interesting, taking seven foot cardboard cutouts of Shaquille O'Neal into retailers in Yorkshire. who were like, what bloody hell's that? Shaquille O'Neal, 
Shaquille what? And he had to, it was a whole education on basketball and ball. So, but again, I loved it because there was a lot of cold calling, meeting new people. And, and for me, the corporate life was the way because you've got your petrol card, you've got your BT phone cards and you stop at the services and queue up with all the other salesmen making calls back to the office. And then when I got a mobile phone that was the size of a brick in the front of my board Sierra, I was king of the road, mate, I'm telling you. And then I got headhunted to ASICS um, or ASICS, the sportswear brand, who at the time were a growing UK brand. We had a couple of football clubs and into running and I headed up their running market. And that job lasted six and a half years. And that was incredible. I was head of running. We grew the category um, to over 40%. We were working with the best athletes in the world. I was managing contracts with Steve Backley, Jonathan Edwards, Asher Hansen, Paula Radcliffe, just some amazing stuff. So, so I was set, you know, for me, I got a five series BMW with white indicators and tinted windows. So it was the, the daddy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is the salesman's measure of one's self and ability at the <laughs> time. And uh, yeah, I, I, that, that was it for me. And it was only when I lost my job after six and a half years at ASICS, um, there, was, there was some very strange financial goings on with the FD and they just cut costs massively and the biggest cost was marketing. So they, they cut me out and I was back in a world of I've got to fend for myself and it didn't really scare me. I was upset at losing what I thought was the best job in the world, mm. but it never scared me. And I think you're right. It, it goes back to that first attempt and dipping your toe in the water with the Derby runner. It was, well, I've done it before. So what's my skills? How can I make money? Uh, what are my contacts? I had a vast array of contacts then and, and putting it into action really. So what did you do next then? Once you'd, once you'd left ASICS, what happened next? Well, I made a classic mistake, Ben, of trying to do too much because I went into panic mode. And you've got your mortgage and you've got kids and you're like, right, I've got to figure this. So um, a couple of triathletes that I sponsored at ASICS, I'd asked if I could be their manager. And the first one, a young girl called Jodie Swallow, she said, yeah, no problem. And then another girl approached me, Landa Cave, and I said I'd manage her as well. And then the week after she won the World Championships, and then we've got Commonwealth Games and Olympics coming. So I found myself doing deals with Visa and Coca-Cola over the sponsorship rights of athletes. And then I thought, well, I, I need to keep busy. So I set up a little rugby company called Tribal, spelt with a Y, with Rox Roy Theron. And, and Rox is an amazing, amazing man. And he's um, head coach at Derby Rugby Club. And we supplied Derby Rugby Club and we supplied balls. And then um, I was a consultant to a running um, shop company called Up and Running, helped them set some franchises up. And then to round that off, I helped a triathlon brand come into the, the UK and spread their wings, a brand called Orca. But I was doing too much. And I, I was immensely naive to think I could do it all well. And I didn't do it all well. I, I, I probably did a 70% job on everything. And uh, yeah, that, that, so all of those. And then it got to a point where another triathlon company in the UK said, look, Dean, you've decimated my market with this Orca brand that you're helping grow in the UK. Why don't you just come and work for me? So I had the opportunity to step back into that kind of semi-corporate world. I went as a consultant to them, um, left a couple of businesses behind. Roxroy did an amazing job of keeping Tribal alive. Um, that's not going now, but he, he, he was a star with that and his wife, Karen. Um, the running shoe business, I ended up, I had three shops. I had Birmingham, I, I set up on my own as well. So I did that as well, three stores, Birmingham, Long Eaton and Nottingham. And, and that was too much as well. Uh, my motivation was wrong for setting those shops up. My, my motivation was to almost show the Derby runner I could do it again on my own, which was just silly, I spread myself too thin. And I had an instant, one morning, my daughter Ellie, she was really young at the time, she must have been, or what nine and she'd come and sell shoes with me in this shop in nottingham and i had a business partner and to be fair paul did a lot of work whilst i was running around on these other schemes and things and he left the business uh he went into into property and i sat there one day and went i can't do this anymore uh, it wasn't making money i was run ragged and i just rang the owner of the franchises up and i think it was about half past 10 last saturday morning I just, and I was crying, crying my eyes out. I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. 
uh, I, I can't take it. And he's like, don't worry, Dean, I'll pick the shop up, I'll take it over, you've done a great job at, at the way it looks. Uh, and and it, was, it was a failure, but I, I don't mind putting my hand up to that because we all learn from failures. And what I learned from that was I just spread myself far too thin. And that was, that was over a period of, of, what, three and a half years, all those different things. But some of those things were a legacy on me, as in the triathlon. So where we'd grown Orca, the new company had picked me up and said, come and work for us. So I put all that behind me and went and, and buried myself deeply in this company in Swindon. They were called the American Bicycle Group and they distributed brands like Lightspeed, Quintana Roo, uh, Tomac Mountain Bikes, and they did wet, triathlon wetsuits. Interestingly, that was my, another introduction to my second wetsuit brand. And, and, the, and they set me up uh, running their European office uh, sales and marketing from Swindon. So I used to commute down there on a Monday, do a couple of nights, stay over in an Ibis, and then head back and then do um, one day working from home. Which was fun. Yeah, sounds like a sounds like a good deal. On that's that. a long answer, mate. Sorry. No, no. Well, that's exactly what we're looking for. So then, what is the sort of summary between then and the and the launch of Hoob? If you could give us a, an overview, and then how you took those lessons that you'd learned in terms of sort of focusing on the few and not the many, and then use that going forwards. Yeah. So um, the American Bicycle Group. Um, I did a couple of years in the UK. And then they asked me to go and live in Tennessee, Chattanooga, and take the whole family and run their global marketing, wow. which, which I did. And I did some rebrands on some of their bikes. We, we, we just gave them a bit more of a contemporary look with some great designers there. The guy, Brad Devaney, was an amazing designer. Steve Lewis, a guy who ran it, was, was just so supportive. So I went over there. I brought the house with the swimming pool, with the jacuzzi. Um, and the dollar was two to the pound, so I was rich as rich could be, so I thought. Um, and and we, we did that for two years in the States. Um, the American company brought uh, one of their investors in, who to this day I, I call Lord Farquad, because he had this strut about him and this arrogance. And he looked at me and said, Dean, you're British, and you, you British think you know everything. And I'm telling you, I've done one triathlon, I know as much as you. Okay, you know, I mean, the man's still there today and he owns the business, so good on him. Maybe that doing one triathlon did put him in a sphere of knowledge that I'm unaware of. <laughs> um, so we, we, didn't, we, we didn't hit it off, we clashed. And he nicknamed me Shrek and he was Lord Farquaad. And so Shrek left the camp and I wrote that on my door on my last day in my office. Shrek has left the swamp. And I went and did a, a, a little bit of a spell uh, for a, a company called Linsky Titanium, who were also in Chattanooga. And I was helping out a mate called Dave Locker who owns Planet X Bikes. And then I got a phone call six months later um, from a friend, Tim, at a triathlon wetsuit company called Blue 70. And he asked if I'd run their um, global sales and marketing. And I could run it from anywhere in the world. And he paid me to go home. I, I, I had to come back. And the Blue 70 was a lifeline. He contacted me, Tim, who ran the business, and said, right, anywhere in the world. So I said, I'll come back to Derby. Uh, where the family roots are and i set an office upon green lane um, at the top in the old schoolhouse um, a couple of great members of staff there that i knew from school and i, I worked for blue 70 for well, was four years and we we took them to being the leading triathlon wetsuit brand and we also moved into swimming and you might remember the the suit wars in the pool where it was uh it was all about that suit's too fast and it should be banned, even yeah. though top speedo athletes had worn a suit and said theirs was the fastest. We came along with one that was a bit faster and so did a lot of other brands. And it just caused havoc in the marketplace. And uh, we, we, we went to battle with Fina. And it was a massive, massive learning experience. And it was whilst I was working for Blue 70, I, I travelled to Seattle and back. Uh, once a month I was in Seattle for a week and I'd be back in the UK. Um, but part of those travels, I met a wonderful professor called Hoob Tucson. And Professor Hoob asked me to look at working on a, tr uh, a swimming suit for a swimmer that he was working with called Martin van der Weyden. Martin had had cancer. He'd come out of that cancer and he was looking to win gold at the Olympics. So um, I said I would. And we worked together on a suit. We made this suit for Martin and he went to Beijing Olympics and won gold in wow. this suit. 
And he was going to be in big trouble with his federation because they were Nike sponsored if he didn't win gold. <laughs> he did. And, and that started a relationship off with uh, Professor Hoob. Um, uh, Hoob came back into my life when I left Blue 70. Uh, they have done with me. I'd, I'd done my time there. They've been amazingly supportive. And we both agreed it was time to move on, which was a bit sad, but I was excited to set something up. Uh, I went to the banks and they didn't really want to know. It wasn't probably the best time anyway in 2011. Did you know what you did want to set up after you'd left the previous wetsuit company? Did you know, did you have a rough idea what it was going to be? Or was it just another moment of, I know I'm going to be able to sort myself out, but now I need to think of the idea. No, you're dead right. It was a case of um, me and my son joke about the Rocky. It's not how you get hit, it's how you get back up again. And he takes the mick out of me for that. <laughs> but it was one of those moments of where's my strengths and how do I play to it? So I knew by now I've been working in triathlon wetsuits. I knew the industry exceptionally well. No one else had worked in swim, bike and run the way I had done. So I thought, actually, I've got some, some strengths here. I really need to play to it. So I put a business plan together. Um, the, the investors in Nottingham Turning Point that were led by uh, a guy called Tom Moorhood and Mark Dolman, uh, they, they asked me to go and pitch to 12 individuals in Nottingham. Um, they liked the pitch, uh, they liked me, so they gave me £25,000 and they said, Dean, you've got to go away um, you know, with your dream of building a triathlon clothing wetsuit company. And you know, this was end of September. And so you've got to come back with $300,000 worth of orders. You've got to prove your wetsuit's the fastest and you've got to get an Olympian wearing it. And if you do that, we'll give you a hundred thousand to buy the stock. So I, I, I toddled off. The buying season was over. We're into, you know, autumn now, but I, I got my wheelie bag um, with my samples in and I was touring all over the country, going to, on, on knock on doors of shops. It was um, Christmas week. And I was in Tunbridge Wells and I was seeing a shop down there. And it was, it was quite an adventure, but a scary one because I've got four kids. Um, university would have been living in a few more years. And I just had to make it work. And thankfully, I had the faith and belief from those investors and then and belief from my family and my wife, especially, you know, Andrew's incredibly supportive. And um, any business owner, without the support of your partner and your family, you, you're worth nothing. Because if you're coming home and they don't support you or back you, then you might as well just give in. But if they're right behind you and they believe in it with you, it's going to be a fantastic journey and they can take some of the hits with you. You don't tell them all the hits because <laughs> you, you have to body blow a few of them yourself, don't you? As you know. Um, but no, it's, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a great challenge. I hit the, I hit the marks. I didn't get an Olympian wearing the suit when I had the two standbys, which the investors said was good enough. And Professor Hoover agreed to work with me. I trademarked his name. And then I told him at Schiphol Airport, I trademarked your name, do you want to work with me? He said, well, I really ought to. And it was great with Hoover because he said, I work with you on one condition. He says, whatever I tell you, you should do to a suit because scientifically I can prove it will make it faster. I really would like you to do it and not ignore me. And I'm like, that's why I'm here because you're the smart man. I, I've come to you for your knowledge and brains. And he said, well, that's my only condition because I've gone to other sports brands in the past with the secrets to speed and none of them have listened to me. So I said, no, this is going to be a wonderful partnership. And, and, and yeah, we were rolling, mate. We, um, I delivered my first product uh, May the 1st at the Olympic Open Water Venue 2012 Hyde Park. <laughs> Wow. So just taking it back a couple of steps there, when you'd been to see these investors originally, did they give you a, a time limit for the stipulations that they put in place for you? The 300,000, the Olympian? Well, they, they didn't, but I set my own time limits because I was governed by the season for 2012. Uh, I'd have to deliver my product in February, March, April at the latest anyway. So there was already a calendar of industry that was set that I had to meet. So that they knew I was going to be, I was like a greyhound out the gate. And did the business actually have a name then? Because you've said you didn't trademark Hoob until a bit later on. What were you actually calling the business when you were pitching to investors? <laughs> so when it was Hoob when I went to the investors, but it only, it only came to life as Hoob at the end of August, so like a month before. I was going to call it Flynn. And I'm a big fan of the movie Tron and Flynn's Arcade. 
And someone said, no, there's a TV show in the States, isn't there? It's stupid like Flynn or something. So I was like, oh, what are we going to call it? And it was my daughter, Tyler. And she said, why don't you just call it Who? So I got a napkin. We were, we were in the Rainforest Cafe um, restaurant. And I wrote on a napkin, Who? And I tried to make it look futuristic and spacey. And I went, that's it. And it, it was just that moment. And it brilliant because it's Germanic. It means bright mind. Um, and it, it's also generic and it, it, it could apply it on anything. It wasn't like, let's call the brand, you know, deanswetsuits.com. <laughs> generic and we could transfer that into anything. So yeah, thanks to my daughter. Thank you, Tyler. And so Dr. Hoob then, was he quite a well-known person in the, you know, specific sports world? All these other brands wanted to work with him. Was that because athletes knew of him and his science? It was more, there was a secret few who knew of him. Right. Who, who, Who's like probably knowing the Wizard of Oz in a way? Except <laughs> this wizard was a proper wizard behind the curtain. That not many, you know, if you knew about who, you knew you got someone there who was mega smart and, and knew how to make a difference. And Martin van der Weyden understood what who could bring to his swimming. The Peter van der Hoogen Band Swim Centre in the Netherlands, in Eindhoven, um, Hoob's PhD students worked out of there. So it was a case of, a lot of brands had been to Eindhoven to use his piece of equipment, which is called the MAD system, which is the measurement of active drag. And that was a, a groundbreaking piece of equipment that measures your drag while you're swimming and who invented it. So he was kind of also known through that. And he's got many, many papers out there. So if you took the best six of the best knowledge brains of, of swimming in the world, who is in it and anybody who knew swimming, if you mentioned his names, their eyes would light up and like, do you know, you know who I go, yeah, yeah, he's an investor. No way. And yeah, he, Professor Hoob is a wonderful friend and carries a massive amount of weight and, and without his support and testimony, yeah, th this brand would be what it is for sure. Um, why do you think it was that the other brands that had been with him in the past weren't using his recommendations? Was it because it was more expensive to make a faster suit or they just thought they knew better? I think you're right with the, they knew better. Um, I think when you're in the sport of triathlon or swimming, if you're not with the biggest brands, say an arena or a speedo, I think you're using other brands as transitional to maybe a big job at an Adidas or a Nike or whatever. So I don't think the heads of categories hung around that much. So did they really want to move into a big project that would take some investment? Um, we invested over 300,000 to improve the MAD system that Professor Hoop made. And other brands, I think, would be scared of doing that. I also think there's ego, you know, how, how dare someone like Professor Hoob be telling, you know, the Aqualab how to do things. I do know that certain brands would get all the clever people from swimming in a room. And uh, it, was it, is it Chatham House Rules, isn't it? Where you, you have the chat and you don't share anything outside the room. I could be wrong. Yeah, and no, no, those, it sounds familiar. I think you could be right on that one. Yeah, and they, they'd have those discussions and, and take whatever they could away from it. Um, but I think it was just down to being able to think without your blinkers on. And that's what who was, who was challenging us to do. And when I lined up all the best wetsuits in the world in the railway lounge at Schiphol Airport, when I, when I first proposed business partnership, he just walked around each suit laughing and giggling. He said, oh, I've written a paper on that and showed that that doesn't work. And, and why have they done that? Because that's counterintuitive to X, Y, and Z. And it was so funny. I said, can you make me anything faster than this? And he just looked and went, yeah, of course I can. But you must listen to me. Top blow. And now all of the, the businesses that have um, had representatives on the show, all of the entrepreneurs and business owners that I've spoken to have operated in competitive markets. There's not many markets that aren't competitive. But if I was going to pick one that I'd perhaps avoid in terms of trying to break into as a brand new brand, it would be the sportswear industry because you've just got absolute monsters out there with huge marketing budgets and, and long yeah. established names. What were some of the things that you initially did just to, to get the name out there as a, as a brand new settle? Well, I, I knew I had a niche product and a, and a, a niche benefit, shall we say, but I decided to look at it like, so, so wetsuits, everyone was running around doing triathlons in a black suit with a logo across the chest and they all looked pretty much the same. And I kind of figured that I needed my suits to look incredibly good. And that's going to give me a point of difference in a shop, in a magazine, in a brochure, whatever it may be. 
So I spent $5,000 on um, screen prints from the factory, um, the screens to print on, on the suit. And every other brand will probably spend $70. Uh, the fact I spent that much, the factory said, you don't want to go ahead with this, do you? I went, no, I do, because it will look amazing. And when the suit came out, it did look absolutely stunning and totally different than anything else. And then I started thinking about the consumer. Now, the consumer that swims terribly wants to wear the suit of the guy or the woman who swims incredibly well. Hmm. So I'd want to wear the same suit as Alistair Brownlee. He, 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 he would lap me in a swimming pool after three lengths, but I want to wear the suit. So what I did was I, I built features and benefits for a, a poorer swimmer into a wet suit and lots of features and benefits for an incredible swimmer into the other suit, but they both looked identical. And one of them had what was called a three, five buoyancy. So more buoyancy in the thighs and hips to get your legs up. And the other one was a four, four, which was four millimeters top and bottom because it, that's for the swimmer who's got a good body position in the water anyway. And what we actually found was that 85% of the triathlon market did not come from a swimming background. So I needed to serve the majority of the market. No one else was doing that. They were serving the 15% by giving them a buoyancy level on the upper body and the lower body that was equal. And I said, it can't be because you've got your lungs in your chest, but you've got no lungs in your legs. So let's stack the legs full of buoyancy and lift them up and create a much more, um, freedom feeling no suit feel swimming experience for the for the not not so um accomplished swimmer shall we say or triathlete and you know now that's the mainstay of our it was going to be a mainstay 85 percent it took a bit of education but i knew i had to go to market with a huge point of difference in look and a huge point of difference in my story but also credibility so i got professor who to agree to work with me and put faith in me and then there was two guys, Adam Young and Paul Newsom, from a company called Swim Smooth. They are the people you go to if you want to learn how to swim front crawl correctly and as fast and as efficiently as you can. There's no team individuals better. So I went to Swim Smooth and said, if I gave you a, a small piece of the pie, would, would you work with me on this? And they agreed and gave me endorsement. Now they've got a database of, at the time, I think it was about 50,000 swimmers. So they started to tell everybody about this new brand that they've actually helped me design the product. And they did. We sat in a cost of coffee before one of the partners of the business decided to swim the channel. And we had Shelley Taylor Smith, who's the most accomplished open water swimmer ever. And we were sat there on a really cold uh, morning designing wetsuits that would make people faster. There's no way I could have got that input with that Adam and Paul and Swim Smooth. With, from Shelley, and then there was their Adam and Paul's input. So I came to market, if you like, with a knowledge base around me that untouchable is the wrong word, but it, 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 it was pretty armor plated, shall we say. I've got knowledge, credibility, and validation behind it, behind everything I was talking about in the suit. And before you actually launched the business, if you could sort of rate it on a scale of one to 10, 10 being absolute certainty and zero being you had no idea whatsoever, what would you have given yourself in terms of your belief in that this oh, is going to be something that, that works? This is going to sound super cheesy, but failure never even entered my head because I couldn't let failure happen. Uh, There's a whole family depending on me to look after them. Now, Ange worked as well, so it wasn't all on me, but that's how I felt. So failure just never, ever entered my head. When I look back now, I'd have given myself a three or a four <laughs> because the task was so monumental. Um, yeah, if I was asked to do it again, I'd, say, I'd probably say not a prayer, although with what's happened with coronavirus, you think, oh, Lord, I may have to do this one again. <laughs> we'll see how it pans out. Um, but no, it, 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 it never crossed my head, and that's not arrogance at all. That was just, it, it had to succeed. So that was all I could think about. And how long did it take for you to get to a point where you felt comfortable that it was working? Was that from day one or did it take a while for the sales to start coming in and the brands to start to get some sort of recognition? It, it, again, a, a great, great question, Ben, because you, you go through ups and downs and, you know, the old ones, I remember that TV show, wait till your father gets home while he's driving home and the road goes up and it goes down and goes up and then goes down. Um, it was when I'm in my garage, and we did half a million pound in the first nine month financial year. And this was out of your garage? Yeah, out of my garage. 
And then the following year, we took it to a million pounds out of my garage. And we signed the Brownlee brothers whilst I was in my garage. <laughs> Did the Brownlee brothers know at the time you were still in a garage? I don't think I told the manager, but he'll, he'll probably listen to this. And he's, he's the nicest man ever on the planet. Actually, he had a huge belief in me, which I'll forever be eternally grateful. Um, I'm not sure if I told him I was in the garage, but I think the picture we painted to the world was we had the, it was some Dallas style glass building somewhere that we were part of. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember the conversation with him about signing the boys, and yeah, he had he had immense and massive belief. But th at that point, when we'd, we'd done a deal with the Brownies, and I got the contracts through, and I'm thinking this is it now. We're in a great place, and I read the contract wrong. And I thought the contract looked like it was double the amount that it actually was. And I rang the manager up, Richard, begging and groveling through a voicemail. What a fool I've been. I can't believe I got the numbers wrong. I've got to let him and the boys down because I couldn't afford that. And then he rang me back and said, Dean, you're numpty. Read the, read the contract. It's kind of like a double up. It, it's classed with both of them in one document. In which case, I, he, he howled laughing and said, I've never heard you be so humble. I'm going to save that voicemail for the rest of my life. <laughs> so it probably hasn't somewhere. Um, that was a time when I felt, this is it. When, when the Browns are putting your faith in you, this is incredible. And other athletes, Henry Schoomer and Richard Varga and co. Um, and then the business kind of flatlined a bit. And it was when I was talking to Santander who could not be more supportive in my journey so far, and especially right now, I have to give them a call out through this coronavirus. They were the first people to say, let's have a meet. What do you need to get through this? Incredible. Cooksey and Brummett, amazing guys, and the rest of the team. And Santander came along with a product that was the breakthrough, um, it was breakthrough program they had. And John Bennett um, had come to me through uh, Smith Cooper. And again, an, an amazing, amazing support. Smith Cooper, they, they did the books for me and helped me with my business planning. Even when they thought I was a crazy guy, like you said, trying to take on other sports brands, but they had a little spark of belief in me and that, it, it, you know, that's eternal loyalty for me. But anyway, um, so Santander came along and this product they got called Breakthrough, but they said, you need, you need a, a better FD. I've got a great financial controller and they just said you need to upscale and i basically went out and found three amazing people um the one that i opted for david lamb is was was um far too good for the business scared me employing him but if it's a financial director that makes sure the money moves and everything works then he should have been able to pay himself so my my figuring was if he can make it work and says he can, then brilliant. So David came in. Um, the two others that came for the, um, for the job, one of them ended up working for us in, uh, in another capacity. And then the other guy um, has, he's, has become an amazing and amazing friend um, out the back of it as well, who I trust dearly. So, yeah, out of, out of Santander saying, get yourself someone decent, I've got um, three friends and a great FD who was, who was more driven than me we did some, I did some um, personality testing and I thought I was driven, but he, he knocked me off the top slot, Lammy did. And I, I think that's, that's been a massive lesson to me because financially I'm good with me, me acumen and I'm good with me margins, but give me a spreadsheet and it just bores me. Um, I'm dyspraxic. I can't sit still for long and focus on that kind of stuff. So David took all that off me which allowed me to go and be creative. But he, he drove the business and we were adding 20%, 65% onto turnover. And that's because of his incredible drive and seeing what could be done with a pool of money. And rather than me relying on letters of credit, because I was naive and thought that was the only way to get product moving, he brought trade finance into the business uh, and then a, a new level of invoice financing and moved everything and readjusted it all around with Santander. So that was... That's what really kicked the growth. Yes, the Brownies double turnover for me, which is amazing um, through credibility. But by having right people in your business and, and able to do things a lot better than you are was so valuable to the business. Yeah, so that's a great lesson. Thank you for sharing that one as well. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times the Brownlee brothers who have become, no doubt, a household name. And you got them quite early on in, in Hoob's journey. 
you've you've already just alluded to the fact that they doubled your turnover, which sort of answers the question in regards to how important is it for brands and sports brands and specialist sports brands to have endorsements from the sort of the superstars of the sport, and what sort of things do you have to do for them? Well, you know the the brownies are the easiest athletes to work with, and the higher up the echelons you get, you often find that. Um, you know, you, you've got Georgia and Jess, the top girls um, that we work with, Henry Schumann, uh, all these athletes, Christian Blumenthal, they're just quite easy to work with because they say, it's quite simple, right? I want the fastest product. <laughs> I want, I mean, the brownies in their wetsuit, it was I want the most flexible and I want the most buoyant. And it doesn't get too complicated. And it allows me to go and produce some amazingly beautiful and fast kit and research it and satisfy their needs, you know, shall we say quite easily. They are demanding though. So there's no point going and deliver something half baked because, you know, Alistair will look at you with a wry smile and go, it needs to be better. Uh, and you've got to go away and deliver that. But they're, they're, a, they're amazing to work with. And for my business, it's, it was a, a paradigm shift in how we were perceived, how we were respected, and how everyone around us in the business community saw us. Um, I think businesses in the sports world, you need heroes. Whether you're going to go and afford, afford to get a Michael Jordan esque of the world, you probably can't, but you can get local heroes. So the heroes in the UK are not going to be the heroes in Spain or in the USA. And the heroes in Derby or Derbyshire are not going to be the national heroes yet. Derbyshire Institute of Sport will make sure that any Derbyshire sports person will definitely be a national and international hero when they've done their bit. But I do believe you've got to have national heroes. David Beckham, Pradidas, was a massive national hero. And then, of course, he, he went obviously global. But all of these will start at a national level. And for us, if we can have the fastest swimmer in triathlon, that validates our product and that comes out the water first every time. Even the Olympic Games, Richard Varga came out with a big hoob logo on his chest. You know, can money buy that? Probably not really. So I've got, you've got credibility heroes. And you've got personality heroes and performance heroes. And we're very lucky that most of ours have a mixture of all of that. And when it comes to innovating for new products, obviously to people who are outside of the sport and don't appreciate the, the technicalities of a swimsuit, you'd think, well, there's only so far you can innovate. But, you know, looking through the products that you've got on your website, you've come out with these trousers that are heated so they warm your <laughs> legs up, which look amazing. I'm definitely going to have to get myself a pair of them just for sitting down at the desk, never mind going out <laughs> and exercising. But do, do your athletes that you sponsor sort of play a part in your product development as well? Do they chip in with ideas or is it literally just we've designed this? Can you tell us how it works? You, you've got a mixture of both because you, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So I can say to Professor Who, how do I do X, Y, or Z, or how does this work? And then when we get into why it works and how it works, it's a case of can we improve that even further with new technology, new science, new investigation. Uh, the Brownlee brothers, for example, with their wetsuits said flexibility and buoyancy, that's it. But I'm working on a new swim skin project with Alistair at the minute, and he's not really asked for an improvement. I said, I want to improve it. I left the door open, sorry. Um, I'll go back. Do you want me to cut? Sorry, I've left the door open downstairs. No, it's all right, keep going. So, um, yeah, Alistair hasn't asked for a new swim skin, but I've gone to him and said, I can make you a better swim skin. And so we, we've gone down to a, a a performance facility in Northampton, 3D scanned his body. So now we can do lots of fittings with a new swim skin without him being there, which helps Alistair because he can, he's had 10 fittings of this new suit without even being there, which is monumental. It's not, it's not wasting his time, not it's a waste, but it's not taking him away from training. It's not us using up personal appearances with him. It's a benefit for all. We've got the same or, you know, aerodynamics for athletes, 3D models, all designed to make an athlete faster without them actually being there. Um, some athletes are immensely inquisitive and some just trust you um, and, and let you get on with it. You know, we just had Henry Schumann over, uh, Olympic Games, bronze medalist, Commonwealth Games, gold in the triathlon. And it was the first time he'd been in a wind tunnel. This guy's achieved so much, but he'd never been in a wind tunnel before. So that was a, an instance where 
us researching and trying to learn more and being inquisitive really, really helped the athlete just from knowing where to put his hands on his handlebars and don't undo your suit to keep cool because it's going to slow you down on the bike along with a lot more benefits. So it, it, it's a two-way learning thing, really, really is. And thinking back to that first 12 months of being in business, particularly from seeing those investors and being set those milestones to achieve, it was, you know, almost 10 years ago now. But what would you say was your biggest challenge during that first 12 months of being in business? Um, I think it's when you've worked for two of the wetsuit brands before and you've told everyone they're the best, they're the best, trust me, they're the best. And then you've gone out and gone and gone, they're the best and they're the best, trust me, they're the best. And then you come along for a third time and go, can we just readdress that again? <laughs> <laughs> actually fourth time I'd worked for three wetsuit brands before this one um so it was a case of of really making sure I got that point of difference and it was a case of sell-through the, the biggest fear for me was sell-through we can all deliver a product to a back door and have it sat in a stock room but you've got to create that pull and so I went heavy on advertising got as much PR as I could on the forums on the chatter on social media and it was really quite heavy Twitter then and I was fortunate, I just sit there and be on it all the time. No real strategy. I'm sure our friends at Gravity who work with us would be cringing at the stuff I was doing on Twitter. But it was just a case of constantly being in the head and the head and the head. And when we had our first show, so I got the first £5,000 in October 2011. In 2012, in January, February, sorry, I'm at a, a, a consumer show with a really cool looking stand with video. My mannequins were all there naked. Whilst the show, would, the show was opening at one o'clock and at half past 10, I'm at DHL at East Midlands Airport trying to get my suits out of customs. I eventually left there at half past 11. And 11.30, I headed down the motorway to this show in London. And I was late, the show had opened. People are wondering, what are those naked mannequins? Put my suits on and we looked a million dollars we looked so much better than anyone else and we were right at the back of the show but we were just there to talk to people and it wasn't a case of how much can i sell i didn't care about selling anything that show and that was an interesting learning piece for me as well nowadays we tend to go to shows to sell product and to to wipe the arse of the show for want of a better term and cover all our costs and make a little bit when i did my first show and that's how sports shows used to be in all shows it was a marketing cost that you lost and you were there just to talk to people. So in the beginning, I was there talking just to convince people that my way was a bit different than it's thinking, but go and try it in one of the endless pools and you'll see a difference. And a great friend, Will O'Shea and his wife, Janine, came and helped me. And, and you know, she's, she was an accomplished Olympic swimmer. Will's an amazing, amazing triathlon coach. And they were on the stand with me, along with the Swim Smooth guys. So we just had, you know, five people with such excitement and credibility. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was something I knew could backfire if the stock didn't sell through and I have a lot of egg on my face. So I had to do everything I could to create pull. Without pull, your stock's dead in a stock room. And what was your vision for the business back then? Was it just to take over the UK? Was it to go global as you have done now? You're in 32 countries, I think. Or where did you think you could take it? You know, at the time I wanted to take it to be able to pay the mortgage and put food on the table. And again, it's perhaps a bit short-sighted. Um, when I pitched my idea to the investors, it was a case of, you know, we could go to 5 million quite quickly. Um, it, we never got there that quickly because I was naive as to the amazing people and team I needed to put around myself to, to allow the business to grow, not really me, but the business to, to move. Um, and my vision changes month to month. There are days I'd like to be a Nike and think the who philosophy of research, science and reality, which is my milking stool. You, you don't put a chair on rough ground, you put a stool. And that's why a milking stool has three legs that stand up on rough ground. And so research, science and reality are my three legs to this stool. And I think that I can apply that to any sport, be it, be it sunglasses, be it um, cricket, be it rowing, be it nutrition. I'm sure that the brains of the people around me, we could take any product to bits and put it back together better. And again, it's not an arrogant stance, it's the power of the collective 
that I'm very fortunate to be working with. So there are days where I want to be Nike and there's other days and there's days like today, Ben, we're in the middle of this coronavirus um, situation. And there's days that today, I just want it to survive. And I have no vision for growth. It's just a vision of survival. So it does go up and down and it can change day by day. And any business owner, I'm sure you'll, you'll have those great sales days where you're punching the air and you'll go home and you can take on the world and, you know, I'm going to see my name in lights. But then something can happen the next day and you, it gives business is, is so kind and cruel at the same time and it will give and take away at the same, you know, within the same week. Um, and here we are, we're all the businesses, anyone listening to this, we're, we're in that right now. This is a, a take moment and we've got to try and give, but it's a different take moment. We've got to, you know, knuckle down and get through it. So my ultimate vision would be whatever I do with Hoob in the future. And if in 10 years I decide to put my feet up and sell some shares or sell the whole lot, I just want to be able to look back with pride on it and go, yeah, I did that, started that. I, I, I was part of an amazing team that built that and wasn't it great? You know, the worst thing that could happen is someone takes over and, and puts it in Sports Direct. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and how big is that collective around you now, Dean? How many people have you got on the Hoop team? We've got 21 now. Okay. And you've mentioned the, um, the C word there, the coronavirus. We're in about, I think it's day nine or 10 of the lockdown right now. For a, you know, a global sports brand, what's been one of the biggest takeaways for you? so far now that we're sort of deep into it um and i know my fd if he's listening to this and going what's that idiot going to say now <laughs> um, my biggest takeaway is if someone turns the light off have you got enough candles and we we, we didn't have a cash reserve and i'm quite envious there's, there's a an a uh, someone in our space and I think they're sitting on three million quid reserves and I just wish I had a reserve for a, a rainy day because this is more than a rainy day this is a bloody thunderstorm hurricane and tornado whirlwind all in one and we don't know the weatherman don't know when it's ending and that that that's what I've taken away from this and I'm the the biggest um contributor to supporting athletes we support more than any other brand um I, I'm a sucker for supporting charities whenever I can and I'll give, give, and give till it hurts. Um, but right now, I wish, I wish I'd have kept some of that back, just so I could support the staff through this. And you know, they're getting paid a hundred percent. We we transition a lot to furloughing them now. Yeah. But you know, the, the one thing I take away is keep some back for a rainy day. And and my future is going to be running a lot, a much leaner business. And that's not with 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 the staff or the team really, but just all those little luxuries and supports that you do give out and I, I sponsor athletes all over the world really it should be my distributor's job to do that the distributors in each territory could take care of it but i feel it's kind of my responsibility and i should nurture these athletes and i've got to be a little bit more brutal and my daughter ali now looks after sponsorship and she's always telling me off dad you've got to say no you've got to say no you've got to say no so out of corona will come corona i think for dino <laughs> nice like it well, i'd have to trademark that one as well and <laughs> you mentioned there that one of your hopes is in 10 years time you can look back on your journey with pride what would you say has been your, your proudest moment so far in the hube journey or your biggest success um biggest success uh well i mean there's there's, there's several i think one of the things i was most proud of was when we brought the Jensen Button Triathlon to Derby. And alongside that was a triathlon for kids that are uh, with disabilities and also able-bodied. Now, there was no business acumen for that. That was just a case of, can we get the Jensen Button Triathlon to Derby and do something great in Mark Eaton Park? But then to be able to tie that in with Daley Matthews, and Daley won the Sports Personality of the Year Helen Rollison Award. And just what we saw that day and the amazing the, the amazing delight in the eyes of some of these kids and the parents who were able to see their kids do a triathlon possibly not been able to in the past because of an accessibility issue it was one of the, the most amazing things i've ever seen so that 
was a massive, massive uh, achievement. Um, I guess the other one would be the Olympic Games. It was Rio. And the fastest swimmer in triathlon, Richard Varga, we sponsored his federation. And we read the rules better than anyone else and found out you could have a 30 centimeter squared logo if you were the kit manufacturer. And we produced these suits for Richard with a big logo on. And he turned up a, um, equipment check at the Olympics and they were, he was told it was too big. Sorry, you've got to go and get it blocked out. So he, uh, he went and had it blocked out and went back the next day and they went, Richard, we read the rules. You were right. It, it is allowed that big. And he says, it's okay. I've got a spare one. So we filled the Derby Quad Theatre with members of Marketing Derby and friends and family. And we had the triathlon from Rio on live. And we had a couple of our supported athletes giving commentary. And first out the water in his red suit with a big hoob logo was Richard Varga. And that, that's, that was pretty impressive for You're me. You're not going to get much more special than that, are you? That's like a movie moment. It, it really was. And to be able to share that with so many amazing friends in Derby and the business community that helped me in one way or another. And the bank were there and Bailey was there and family were there. That was almost like saying thank you to them. How did it make you feel at the time when you saw him coming out the water oh, with that logo in blazing? Now. It's getting me now just <laughs> talking about it. Oh, and even, even Sue's jumping in and got something to say about it. Um, how did I feel when I saw that? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it just really got to me. I had to have a pint. Um, and it was like an idea and a necessity is there logoed on the front of a suit coming out of the Olympic Games being watched by millions. Yeah, it, it was pretty satisfying, but very humbling. It's like, I think I had a little part to play in that, but everyone else had a bigger part to play. It sounds amazing. Now, we've talked about your biggest successes and proudest moments, and usually I flip that to a time when things weren't going so well, but I think most of us are experiencing that right now. So when we're going through situations like this, how do you keep yourself positive and keep yourself driven or or do you has it has it got you sort of down in the dumps and you're struggling oh no it um today is not a great day so I was, I was really pleased we could do this today because i just had a had a couple of crappy emails this morning that didn't set the tone very well and you, the thing is you no matter how down you feel about it you've got you, you you've got to project a positive approach to it because you're asking 20 members of staff to come with you and, and knuckle down and furlough at home and trust me and we'll get through it and we will get through it yeah. and we're trading on our website now and the team are working so so hard to get every pound in it's incredible how well they've all come together but you do sit back and go all right you know are we going to be here how long is it going to take what's going to happen you know, we still wait for grant money to come through from, from local government. And I, I just wish some of those support mechanisms that were there would could be expedited a little bit. And I'm probably more fortunate than a lot of other businesses that have completely had their knees taken out, especially if you're in you know, the food business, uh, pubs and dining, um, incredibly overnight. So, yeah, it's it, <laughs> you do have your dark days, but what you need to do is get on, get on your bike, or go for a run or go for a walk, hurt your body in another way, and then suddenly it don't feel so bad. <laughs> so before I come on to you, I've been on my exercise bike. I've been I've been on the Zwift and done done an hour of, of leg pain. Ray, raise your pain threshold. I like that way of looking at it. And so if if we could sit be sitting here, Dean, in 12 months' time and we're having a, a conversation again about what's happened over the previous year, where would you like to see yourself and Hoob? I'd like to see I'd like to see us um, still trading, still with the same team, no casualties, um, with a different budget in front of us. And maybe we're going to have to manage the sales budget a little bit. We're going to have to seriously manage the expense budget. I'm going to make sure I've got my airbags, you know, my, my plan B, if you like, my reserves. And um, I'd like to think that if you ask me the question that if coronavirus came again, are you ready for it? I could go, yeah, we can go three, four months and not sweat it because right now you're asking not only your staff but your suppliers and people you owe money to to work with you and I, I and I've seen all these company statements that are all so vanilla 
I put our statement out that was quite honest and just said, please give us leniency. We'll, we'll be lenient with you and that with our athletes. We support you when you're injured. Well, bear with us. We're injured at the minute, but we're going to get through it. And all of that, I want to make sure that all that trust and faith that's given and shared around businesses right now, uh, you know, can be repaid. And if that means I'm with the same sock supplier for the next 20 years, then so be it. Because this is a real test now of how much you believe in your customers, how much suppliers believe in you, and, and how much they're, they're going to back you and support you. So yeah, in a year's time, I'd like to think we, we're where we have been, but a damn sight smarter and a little bit leaner. Okay, good way of looking at it, most definitely. Now, over your career, you've obviously had a lot of people buy into you as an entrepreneur and a business owner, Dean. And when you were talking to the investors originally about the, the launch of Hub and, and the wetsuit business, I'm sure they perhaps bought more into you than the actual product itself. And you, you, you're probably going to have to um, talk to the ego here. But what do you think is, it is about you? What attributes and beliefs and mindset do you think you have that comes across so well to other people, be it business owners or business partners or investors? Um, well, I, I think there's lots of things that come over that people would find immensely annoying and go, he's a bit of a prat and a knob. <laughs> and I can take that. I understand that. But I think, I think if I've got any qualities, I think enthusiasm is a quality, um, positive, positive approach. And I, I'm a problem solver, uh, certainly problems uh, that I know a little bit about. And I, and I think if I can help somebody out, I will. And I think anyone in, in the Derby community, I'd like to think if anyone's asked me for help, I've managed to come through for them. And so I, I think it's just a case of people can rely on me. Um, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the brand that will pick all my distributors up from the airport and all of their family. And they tell me that there are other brands that they distribute don't do that, or they don't go to the lengths we go to. And I will always go the extra mile. I'm a huge, huge believer in it. And you're not doing it for any benefits today, but you know what? It may be a benefit in five years to 10 years. Um, so I'd like to think, yeah, I'd like to think people say, you know, I'm sociable, um, I'm supportive, I'm enthusiastic, uh, and I'm there to help them. Okay. It's probably not the best time to be asking this question, but what are some of the things that you enjoy about being a business owner? You know, if I could have asked this maybe two or three weeks ago, what would your answer have been then? Well, you know what? It's, um, I think as business owners and anyone listening, I think we perhaps don't appreciate what's the good things of being a business owner because I should be sitting here going, you know what, Ben, I love riding to work and getting in at half past 10, 11 into the office and I have my shower and I go around and talk to everybody and I make everyone a cup of tea and I review the figures and then I ride home again because I've got an amazing team that are in charge and in control and my team are in charge and are in control. But for some reason, I've got this thing in my head that I need to be there closest to nine and I can't be one of the first to leave the building and I shouldn't have a lunch break, although I'm always seen in bear all the time. Um, so, yeah, but what, what do I do enjoy? Um, I think I enjoy the freedom to make decisions, wrong ones and good ones at the same time. And that's a wonderful, wonderful freedom. You do need sense checks and certainly in the time we're in at the moment with the virus i'm giving you know I'm, I'm sense checking everything with my fd and he's sense checking stuff with me because you need to do that but i i think the freedom um and and to be able to give back where you can and if that business community looked after you to be able to turn around and go we'll support x y and z and it's it's also nice to have your family feeling proud of you my mum and dad save every single newspaper or magazine that i've been in and as i'm trying to be in the newspaper more than graham mulholland um you know that that's quite a stack of, of the telegraphs um so that's quite a nice thing to be able to make your family and your parents proud to see something that you've built but i could probably enjoy it more and if it wasn't the times that we're in that right now or well, certainly after this Ben, i'm going to reset um what i take to the business and what, I, what my strengths are giving it and also what i need to be able to give that to the best it can be and it might be i need to let a few things go and i need to be out on my bike for the hour a day because that's when i get my best ideas and 
just let go of some things, you know? What do you think are some of the misconceptions that people have about being a business owner or an entrepreneur? Or maybe what are some of the things that you've had to sacrifice personally, whether it was starting up the business or, or to get it to where it is today? Yeah, great question, mate. We can all go and get the self-help books from Waterstones and the four-hour work week. And what is it? The, um, how to not give a, a, you know, beat that one out. About yeah. And all that stuff. I mean come on if you've got your own business you never turned off you're always thinking about it you're always watching your competition you're never off your phone and most of it isn't phone calls because people don't frame make phone calls anymore it's all whatsapp and email so you're always typing away on your phone and you're engrossed in it and then there's the fact that you took the risk in the first place you know pe people now in the business or want to be in the business it it's nice because you're going to be employed and you're working for somebody but in the beginning, you take all the risks and all the punts and all the decisions are on you. And if they don't work out, you've got to figure out how to get around it and still survive and look at your family and go, it's all right, I've got your backs. This is going to work. So there's, there's huge sacrifices. There's stuff we put on the line. I don't know about other business owners, but there's only one name on the one personal guarantee in my business and it's mine. And yet I've got a whole host of shareholders, but it's mine. And I'll stand by that and, and, have, and have to manage and live with that. Um, but you're never off. You're always, you're always living and breathing it. You can't drive down a street and not look at a for sale sign, can you? No, unfortunately not. No. <laughs> there you go, you see. You're never going to switch off. <laughs> Would you have it any other way, though, if you could choose to have that silence after 5.30 or whenever you get home? Would you have it that way, or do you like being on? <laughs> you're reading my mind through this camera. Um, <laughs> no, I couldn't do it, mate. I think we thrive off being wanted. So there's probably a bit of a, an, e an ego there that needs feeding and, and, and having a place. Um, one thing this lockdown is getting me used to being at home a lot more. And you know what? I don't mind it at the minute. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying walking straight out of bed and the shower to, to sit at a desk, you know, in my office uh, and just crack on with it without the pain of getting into work. And seen a bit more of the family and we've actually sat and had a couple of meals together which is a, a, a bit strange and i've even trained a bit earlier today um to, yeah to, to take my mind away from things with a bit of pain and then i'll be sitting down with everyone tonight and not oh i'll be up back at six half six seven or whatever it may be what would you say is the best piece of advice you've received is there one that sticks out front of mind there, there's been there's been a, there's there's been a couple actually one was from James Cooksey at Santander, when I was talking about getting a financial director, and he said, Dean, get the very best co-driver you can, because you've got no problem with driving at speed, and maybe you can drive too fast, and you need a co-driver to tell you where the corners are, and when to slow down, and when to accelerate, and when to manage your skills. And that was, I'll never forget, that was an amazing piece of advice. I think that was, that, that was James Cooksey and John Bennett with that one. And then, um, I forget where I heard it, but someone said, give and give until it hurts, but you'll see a reward, but you'll also forget the reward, you'll get an immense amount of satisfaction from it. Now, right now, probably give, give and give is, is perhaps not helping me, but I'd still, I'd still live by that, you know? And there's the old ones of, be nice on the way up because you may need it on the way down. I totally live by that one as well because you've got to be nice to everybody. There's an amazing advert on TV. Have you seen it with the guy who's cleaning the areas around Apollo 13? No. Um, and while they're sorting out getting this um, spacecraft back to Earth, there's one man whose job is to make sure the place is tidy. And at the end, it says his job is to take care of any mess. So the other people don't have to and everybody's so important in in any organization and i detest anybody who looks down on anyone else within a business and goes oh they're only this or they're only that everyone has a part to play in, in the bit and everyone is important and ideally you pay them all the same if if you know business allowed you to do that yeah, I think, I think that might link back to that. There's that story, isn't it? I think there was Nixon when he visited NASA, NASA and he came across the janitor sweeping up and he said to the janitor, what do you do here? And he said, I helped to put a man on the moon. So it sounds like that's where they've got the inspiration. Yeah, all, all linked, isn't it? Yeah. 
And so, so taking all of that experience and advice that you've learned over your, your whole entrepreneurial and business career, if you could pass one piece to 21 year old Dean, if you could just give him one piece of advice, one piece of wisdom, what would it be? If, if anything, um, believe in yourself because I, I'm, I'm still not the most confident. The veneer will tell you different, but I'm not the most confident. And if you put me in a room, I have to decide if I'm going to be Dean or Dino. And if I'm going to be Dino, I've got to be loud and everyone knows I'm here and try and take, take control of situations, you know, and be the life and soul. Whereas the reality is Dean's um, pretty quiet, sat in the corner, I'll just sit watching. I'm quite happy to do that. So, and that's part of when I, when I was growing up, I wasn't confident. I wasn't confident at school. It was only because I got into drama that brought myself out a little bit. And an amazing teacher, Andy Price, helped me do that. And, and a lot around us. And so, yeah, I, I, I'd be saying to Dean, you can do it. And, and even the people who look big and flash and important are still human beings. And actually, it's those middle ones that think they're special and brilliant and they're going to go on to achieve something great. And a, and a bit pompous ignore them the ones at the top are really really cool people and they'll listen to you so never doubt your abilities come on dino crack on with it you can do it and that alter ego of dino is that a conscious switch that you make when you're in social environments or does it just happen naturally now um it happens naturally but mrs jackson picks up on it and goes are we dean or dino <laughs> or she'll tell me she'll go Okay, Dino's out then. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you read, Dean? Do you do any reading of business books or any nonfiction? Um, I love the um, business biographies. I love to know how people have built businesses. Phil Knight, Shoe Dog is the most inspirational book. And I've read it twice. And every, the end of it, every time I read it, I cry. And I want to write to Phil Knight and go, I'm doing what you did. And you had Bill Bowerman and I got Who to Song. But I'm yeah, not there's a lot of similarities between the two stories. And was it similar, you know, in, in the in Shoe Dog, he's traipsing around China, looking in all these factories, trying to get somebody making his shoes for him. Was that similar to the start of Who? Oh, Ben, it was exactly that. I, I wrote to a factory that I knew and said, please, would you entertain making a wetsuit for me? And I begged them. And they said, OK, come and see us. And I went over there and, and I, had, I had quite a, an out there design. And I went, we can't do that, but we could do this. And I sat there and I, I redesigned my wetsuit that afternoon. And they agreed to make it and they charged me over the odds for it but what the hell they agreed to make it and i had to pay up front and all of that but yeah it, it was it was a case of i wasn't proven in business and i'm this young up oh, i wasn't young i was 40 i was an upstart uh, yeah it was uh very very similar to that very similar and so if if you could write your own biography dino or dean whichever one it's going to be <laughs> phil knights with shoe dog what would yours be called um wetsuit willie <laughs> the, the, I like it. The, the boys that i go drinking with um ian uh andy and wilf uh they when everyone wants that they just call me wetsuit and it's short for wetsuit willie so, <laughs> no no one would get it or they think it's some kind of perv book but yeah oh uh, no well they say sex sells so i'm sure it do good numbers in the shops so. <laughs> <laughs> all right i've just got a couple more questions for you dean before i let you uh, get off for the day uh, thank you for spending so much time with us i've no, really it's, enjoyed it's it good, mate. i'm enjoying it to expectations so Again, summarizing everything that you've learned, the experiences that you've been through, the businesses that you've built, the businesses that you've been a part of building. If we were sat in front of an entrepreneur that was about to start in business today in any industry and you could just narrow it down to three pieces of advice that you would like to pass on to that person, what would yep. you tell them? Um, I think one, one for me, and I get a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs, people want to start their own businesses and I always question their hunger and their desperation. Can you pay your mortgage? Oh yeah, you know, dad's gave me a load of money, I don't need to pay my mortgage. You're not desperate then. You, you've got to have the desperation and the hunger to make it happen. Otherwise you're wasting your time. And you watch Dragon's Den and you can tell the ones that are hungry and all, almost virgin desperate. When I started Hoover, I was desperate. I'm, you know, I'd, I'd missed three mortgage payments. You know, I've done whatever I could to stay afloat, and this was that kind of a desperation piece, but it happened to be a passion as well. So I'd, I'd certainly be questioning on, on their hunger. 
And if they didn't feel they'd have it, I'd tell them, and I've told people in the past, that I don't think you're ready for it. Uh, the second one would be, what's your intimate knowledge of what you're going into? And if they say, I know nothing about forklift trucks, but I'm going to invite a forklift truck and go, you know, why are you bothering? If, you, if you're not going into something that you know so well and you're intensely passionate about, don't bother because there's people who are going to be in it and so far ahead of you and know so much more about it. Go away, go to uni, um, go into the industry, do a few years, do four, five, six, ten years, whatever it is. Learn it inside out and then come back again because you'll be in a much, much better position. And then the third one would be make a list of what you're bloody good at and then make a list of what you're crap at and make sure you can cover the bits you're crap at. And, and mine is, is the finance and bookkeeping. So, you know, fortunately, I, I filled that pretty early on. And, and, and so that's it, you know, are you passionate, are you hungry, and do you know what you're not good at? And I think right. if you can figure that, those three out, that, that would be my, my, my nuggets of advice, mate. Yeah, no, amazing. Great pieces of advice, sir. Thank you for that, Dina. And my final question, just to wrap up the interview, if listeners want to find out more about Hoob or they want to uh, find out more about Dean, whereabouts can we find you online? Um, so if you go to hoobdesign.com, um, sign up if you want and we'll bombard you daily with emails because right now we're chasing everything. <laughs> but, but yeah, do go on there and you know, go and look at the products, but have a look on Hoob TV where we've got a lot of our videos and there's some amazing stories of, of the athletes and the people that have helped build and shape the business that it is today. Um, yeah, definitely, I'd say, I'd say do that. Yeah, but who, who design? Um, and because it's such a, a strange and different name, you put who on any search engine, and we're, we're at the top of the natural searches anyway, because what's who apart from a Dutchman's name? A wonderful Dutchman's name. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And all of those links as usual will be in the show notes over at benjaminbrain.co.uk forward slash Dean dash Jackson. Well, that wraps up the interview, Dean. So I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for uh, spending some of your valuable time with us. I know everybody's got so much going on at the minute. So the fact that you were prepared to jump on for what's almost an hour and a half and, and really share some of your business truths and provide some inspiration and motivation to the business community out there. Really grateful for you for, for taking the time to do that. No, I enjoyed it, Ben. Thank you. It's been a, a nice relief and break. Thank you, very, and break. Thank you very much. Appreciate oh, it. Good. Glad of that. I you've hardly done any talking, so I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, you've hardly done any talking. That's what it's all about. The less I talk, <laughs> the better the interview. So that's what I've worked out anyway. But obviously, want to wish you and the team at Hoob all the best for the future. So I've got no doubt you'll uh, weather this coronavirus storm and come back bigger, badder, stronger than ever. And as always, to the uh, Truth About Business listeners, thank you for your support and look forward to catching up with you on next week's episode of The Truth About Business.